Hi, I'm Frederick. I am the machine learning lead at Uncord. As you probably heard, we are hosting the event today. And so I'm here to give a talk about actually many of the things that Robert, he talked about, but didn't really go into, which is quite nice. It was quite a nice segue. So, so thank you, Robert. Um, I am not as experienced as Robert was, but I did start my PhD just around the time where GPT-1 was released. And so I'd spent a lot of time looking about, uh, looking into, you know, next, next word prediction. But I thought I could use it for just predicting pixels. So generate images just by predicting one pixel at a time. Turned out to be a stupid idea, and there are many other ways that are way better today. Um, but yeah, I've also seen much of the field uh, evolve. And so um, today I'll show you something about how you can actually take all these advice we just heard and actually put them into practice. So may I told you that we, we are a, a data company and we provide tools for doing management and curation and notation and model evaluation on your data. And so this is a slide we, we very often bring um, uh, to, uh, to talks. And the reason I wanted to bring it today is not because of the sales pitch, but because I wanted to show you that there are all these arrows around here that sort of circles around, which is kind of this idea about training a model, running inference, using it to run the to sort of speed up or bootstrap your next uh, data uh, life cycle or like data level. Um, and so I'm gonna jump more into how you actually do that uh, in practice. Um, and so first I wanted to quote myself just because now I'm on the stage. Right. So um, if you wanna get to the state of the art uh, model performance, it requires iteration. And that's something we've seen um, both in like literature, but also when we, when we speak to all our customers. And sometimes it can be very fun and very efficient, but other times it can be laborious and it can be soul crushing. And I'm gonna show you in a second why it can be soul crushing. Um, now, the difference is how fast you're able to iterate. Okay, there we go. So it requires a lot of iterations. And typically, um, this is what happens. If you think about this as the life cycle of your data, then the data comes from a start, it goes to some sort of human annotation. And then maybe if you, are, you really care about the quality of your data, you'll also have it reviewed by some other people. And then eventually it becomes complete and you can start training your model. And this is very, very labor intensive, right? Needless to say, I guess. And so we see this happen again and again. And we're, we were like, this, this shouldn't happen. We should be doing like OpenAI or like the new DeepSeek paper or like uh, how Mesa did with Sam or whatever it is. Everyone does, follows the same pattern that we should teach everyone how to do. So that's what I'm gonna to try to teach you guys today. Now, wouldn't it be nice if you could do something like, like this instead? What if you could have this purple thingy that is essentially an agent or a piece of software that can do most of the, the tasks for you? So what if this guy could, could you know, take your data, whether it's images or text or whatever it is, do some magic, and then only once in a while send it to review, uh, such that a human can just double check that something is, like everything is as it's supposed to be. Otherwise, just send it to complete so I can start training, right? Because if I could do that, I could just, you know, run this thing on Ray, and then off we go, and I'm training my model uh, tomorrow, rather than in three months when the humans are done. Right. So that's sort of the, the objective here. Okay, um, so just to sort of validate my claim, I, I brought two different examples here. The first one is from the, the, the sort of more recent uh, DeepSeek paper. And I don't want you to sort of look at all the details of this, this chart. I just want to mention that every one of these uh, sort of uh, squares, they are models that DeepSeek they trained. And none of them were actually really published. I guess the first one kinda, but it's actually only the last one that was actually published. All the other ones were some models that were trained and then used, utilized, and then tossed away. And this is how you should be thinking about it, yeah and building machine learning models. So all the, the sort of small round circles, they are where you add more data. And all the, the these small um, squares, they are when you train a model, right? So, so these guys, they trained four models and added data five times before they reached DeepSeek R1. Okay. So this is just like one validation of, you need to iterate many times before you reach a good model that you can actually use and start creating value with. And one other takeaway here is that they really minimized human labor. It's actually only in this little dot up here where human labor is, is, is like really intense, where they would sort of go through a lot of examples that they generated from the first model to actually validate them and sort of clean them up before they were training the second model. All, most of the other stuff is just automatic, actually. 
presumably run on Ray, who knows. <laughs> the second uh, example I want to give is uh, this one. This is from a video generative model. And so they had this problem that they wanted to train a, a generative model where you give it a piece of text and it, you, it, it'll provide you with a video. And to do that, you need a lot of videos with very high quality captions. And how do you get about that? Well, there are not that many captions on the internet, at least not uh, enough of high quality. So what they did was they built this like, big pipeline where they would take the videos and they would split them into frames and do some sort of uh, uh, image captioning. And then they would take all the captions for all the frames and do another summary based on another model before they eventually had their sort of final caption for the videos of a high enough quality. So again, it's like employing multiple different models, stitching them together in a way where you reach the high quality in the end. But I don't think um, anyone, or like most people don't appreciate um, this fact. So if you think about all these processes, I think maybe 10% is the actual model development. And 90%, like everything under the surface, is just engineering. There's so much engineering going on um, in order to make these things work at scale. And so what we thought we wanted to do at Ancord was that we wanted to take away some of all this engineering pain. And how do you do that? Well, we want to support our customers in iterating fast, right? So we need um, some way of providing them with the tools to build all these different inference loops and, and doing all these filterings and all these things that we've heard about already today in a way where it's both like flexible, it's scalable, and it's reusable. So that was essentially the goal. Um, and I think uh, one more thing I want to mention here is that we have an SDK, of course, for our entire data platform. And you can do almost anything. And in, now we are at the GitHub uh, headquarters here. So maybe a, a good example is, is Git. Um, Git has these kind of porcelain features, Git commit, Git push, Git pull. They're very easy to use, and, and everyone uses them. But they also have a lot of very, very low-level features. You can do all sorts of things with Git, right? Um, but most people don't use them. So, so what I think of our SDK as is this low-level stuff where you can do almost anything, and you can break everything if you want. Um, and now we want to do something that is more porcelain, something that is easier to use. OK. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Fast API. Who, how, how many here, in here knows Fast API? So if you know Fast API, then this should look somewhat familiar. If not, Fast API is, is a way of building APIs fast in Python. Um, and what is really remarkable about Fast API, and now I think it's also remarkable about what we did, is that you can essentially de de define a function, and in the, the sort of function um, head, you specify what you need, and these things will just be resolved for you. So whatever came in from that post request to your API will just be resolved, and you, you're sure that the typings are right, you're sure that everything is just in line, and what you need to do is you need to do your logic, which comes in here, and then you need to return what this API is supposed to do. So in the same analogy, what we did here was we, we built a library where you define what you need. Maybe you have your own custom dependencies, some function that need to run before I can do my logic. Then you do your thing. And your thing could be many different things here. It could be you know, uh, discarding stuff because you don't need it, because the data quality is low. It could be running inference on the data because you need pre-labels. It could be using an LLM as a judge to say, this is good or this is bad. This should be routed to a human. This should not. These kind of things. All these things go in here. And the purpose is really to make the ML engineer just focus on whatever the ML engineer is good at. And all the engineering of like downloading images or uh, you know, uh, loading, uh, whatever, and making sure that everything is initialized, these kind of things, they just didn't happen under the hood. So that's sort of the, the idea here. Um, so that's the flexibility part. Uh, you can take what you need and just what you need. Now, that's the thing, yes. The second thing was scalability. And I'm kind of a bit annoyed now that, that I, I brought this example, because it's not uh, uh, Ray. It's, it's another serverless um, provider. But essentially, if you look at the first four lines of code here, it's, a, it's essentially the same thing as we did before, except that I created another uh, type of runner. And now what I can do is I can put everything into queues. So this is my, my function. This is my worker that's going to run. I'm going to use it with a GPU, and I'm going to run five instances at the same time. And I'm going to take everything, and then I'm just going to put it into the queue. So that's what this last part does. So with like, what, what is that, 10 lines of code? 
you can actually reach scale really, really easily. Um, so this was the scalability part. Um, yeah. Finally, we wanted to make it reusable. So first of all, um, if you want to have the same type of agent nodes in, in your workflows, you will be able to just reuse the same thing and just point it to the right project. So this means that now when I want to do iteration one, two, and three of my thing, where maybe I pre-label, maybe I filter, I can just you know, swap out the project and off we go. So that's what we built. And I thought it would be fun to actually uh, put it a little bit to the test. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I think six days uh, ago, uh, the Google team, they released Pally Gemma 2 Mix, which is a multimodal uh, VLM. And apart from doing stuff like you know, question answering and OCR, which is something we've seen before, it can also do detections. So it can put bounding boxes around things if you ask it to detect Android, it'll actually find Android. And if you ask it to segment things, oh, it's actually hard to see here, but it'll actually put a mask on, on the images. And all these things are not things that were sort of um, pre, uh, predefined. So it's not like I can only say cat and Android. I can say anything I want. Um, so I thought it would be quite fun to, to have a look at it, this, uh, this model and see how, it, how well it actually does. Um, yeah, it's open source and you can fine tune it, which is really nice. Um, so yeah, perhaps you, you might want to have a look there. Okay, so now I'm going to go to uh, my project. So this is within the Uncall platform. And again, this is a, the flow that my data is supposed to follow. So what I just did is I took uh, a data set which uh, was published by Hugging Face. They published a lot of images. Uh, from the internet that was used for pre-training where they found a lot of different concepts that are very rare on the internet. So in this case, I've taken a lot of different birds that are very rare on the internet, and then I wanted to see if, if Gemini could, or like uh, Gemma, uh, Pally Gemma could, could actually detect these, uh, these birds. So what I do is like, I define a, an agent node here where I, I do the predictions. It's going to predict a, a bit mask, and it's going to predict uh, a description of the image. Then I'm going to pass it on to a judge. So I, I use GPT in this case. And I'm going to ask the judge whether the, the description is good enough uh, for my uh, standards. And my standards are, does it mention the right type of uh, the right breed? And if it does, then all good. I'm not going to use it for fine tuning my model uh, for my particular bird uh, purpose. If not, I'm going to send it to a human, human and then he can sort of fix, fix the description. So I'm actually additionally going to ask GPT to, to also make a description while we add it anyway. OK, so that's the flow. And then, of course, we can have a review and complete. And you can probably imagine now that when I have collected these new descriptions, I could take this thing, and then I could actually start you know, fine-tuning it on my, my bird breed uh, problem. OK, um, so I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time here. but. Uh, maybe I just want to show you that this is how it would look for the annotator when, when things come into the, the system then. So since I know the, the, uh, the type of bird already, it came from Hugging Face. I have that pre-populated. And now I have my new description from GPT. And I can very quickly say, is this correct or not? If it's not correct, then I can correct it and then pass it on. So this is essentially the, the, um, the idea. And had I, um, wait, where is the, there we go. Had I started the, the agent, I would have seen these columns sort of trickle, trickle around. So we would have seen data moving from the, the Paligema prediction stage to the GPT as a judge stage, and then further on to annotate, uh, annotation and, and, and perhaps to archive. Um, and so one, one interesting uh, insight here is that it seems like in, what is that? I guess five, uh, like 60% of the time, um, the, the Paligema description doesn't really include the right bird, bird names. So that's sad. Um, but it, it, it proves that I'm, I have to fine tune it. Um, I'll post train it. OK, last thing I want to show you is that I, I told you that I also did um, uh, segmentations. So I thought it would be fun to see these as well. And here I'm in our ev evaluation suite where I can see these sort of traditional things, uh, the mean areas precision, the precision of the model these kind of things. But I can also go in here. Let's see if it works. Choose my predictions. And let's see if I've internet enough here. Cool. So I have a lot of um, true positives. I have some false positives. Um, so maybe let's have a look at those. I think I might need to fill on the class here. Let's look at the, there we go. 
So these are some of the false positives. Here I have my, uh, let's, let's just remove the prediction for a bit. This is my label, this is this bird, and the prediction is everything else, it seems. So sometimes it fails, but most of the time it actually gets it right. So that's cool, so the detection part seems to work quite well, but the, the descriptions, they don't really understand the breeds. Yeah, this was um, actually what I, I wanted to tell you guys uh, today. And um, thank you, Frederick. Let's give a hand, Frederick. <laughs> Do we have any questions for anyone? Let me give you the mic. Uh, are you guys using any uh, agent frameworks? Are you, is everything mostly like internal built-in? No, I think um, uh, in terms of agent frameworks, I think um, most of the stuff we do is uh, you know, revolving around uh, Lama index or, or link chain or these kind of things uh, to, to build uh, agentic workflows. Um, but again, as I said, like most of this stuff is, is made such that you can do what you need to do in your uh, workflows. Um, yeah, so I guess that's, that's the, the short answer. Um, yeah. Um, what I was able to understand from the previous presentation and yours is that, okay, data will be key to we keep improving the model's performance and things. And on your end, that processing and maybe being capable to streamline those informations on a daily basis, it will be the next step. Meanwhile, when we go outside this, uh, these walls, people are still struggling to even organize their data in the companies. Uh, in real world, regular people are living all around and they are not producing data. How do you feel like, okay, we can make, bring this innovation into real world and real companies? How do you feel like that setup process will run? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So. I th one of my favorite questions when I'm speaking to someone um, who's not working with AI is how do you prepare yourself for the future? Because I know what I want the answer to be, which is you should be like, collecting all the data you, you can. Um, but most companies don't. And I think it's, it's a big educational task uh, to do. I think um, it's really, really hard. Um, and I don't have like a, 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 a key um, answer there, but one good observation is that any company who can find a way to add value and sell a product in such a way that you generate data for your next iteration of the, the company, that's the companies who will win. Um, I was betting for a long time on uh, 23andMe, who are these DNA sequencing um, folks, and so they would, they would sell you a like a sequencing of your DNA, they would like test your DNA, see if you, you are like um, you, uh, in risk of getting any sorts of diseases. But really what they were doing, right, they were, they were actually underpriced, like undercutting their own costs to sell the, the, this DNA sequencing. But really what they could do is they could take all this DNA and they could sell it to someone who's trying to develop drugs. And that's actually where they would make the big money. So that's one example of where you sort of, you bootstrap, um, like you use your product to bootstrap data for another problem. Um, I think that's the companies that will actually win. And I think many companies are blind to that fact. Um, completely agree. Yeah, good question. How do you differentiate yourself from scale AI? That's a very concrete question um, and a good one. Um, so I think, first of all, scale AI, they're selling a lot of services. So that means they're selling human labor. And we are not selling human labors um, on the same order. We are selling software as a service. Um, so that's, I think that's the main, main differentiator. And then the second one is that, that we are like, truly multimodal. So it's not mostly about text. I think scale is, is very focused on text. Um, yeah. Any other questions? That side's very quiet. This side's on all the questions. No? Thank you so much, Frederick.